One is a company insider who climbed the corporate ladder for the past 17 years. The other is brand new to the organization and joining from a totally different industry. One developed a long-lasting relationship with Paris. The other happily avoided as much as possible working there. One is the incarnation of a typical French success story. The other is more of a German characteristic success path. Estelle Brakenov, Veolia's next CEO starting in July, and Sabrina Soussan, Suez's next CEO starting anytime soon, have quite different paths and profiles, but they'll soon also have quite a bunch of things in common, leading two groups with a wealth of challenges to overcome, taming and appeasing new executive committees, and being two women in charge of the number one and number three companies in a water industry where men still represent 83% of the workforce, and often even more in executive roles. Will they succeed? I'll share my bet at the end of this video. Ironically, in a different world, they could have worked together. Indeed, both are roughly the same age, and while Sabrina Soussan started her career at Renault, then worked in the automotive industry for almost the entire next 20 years, Estelle Brachianov started in the infrastructure divisions of the Val d'Oise department, then Paris Prefecture. So one was building cars, trucks, and trains, while the other was building motorways and tramway lines. It doesn't stop there. When Estelle Brachianov took over Veolia UK, her teams developed some resource recovery routes that turned wastes into automotive industry feedstock. Here again, one could have been the supplier of the other, just the other way around. So what's the path of Sabrina Soussan in 45 seconds? You ready? Here we go. Born in 1969 in Paris, the future CEO of Suez grew up in Dole, where she was known to be an outstanding pupil and an athlete. She then studied maths in Lyon, then mechanical and aeronautical engineering in Poitiers, before getting an MBA from Dublin's university. Sabrina Soussan started her professional career working for Renault in Paris and was swiftly sent to Finland for three months to run some R&D on motors. In 1997, she formed a 23 years relationship with Siemens, which would take her to Toulouse, London, Regen Innsbruck, Tokyo, Zug, and finally Erlangen, this last role as CEO Mobility. In 2021, she took over the CEO role at Dormakaba, where Suez came to hunt her one year later. On a side, she also sits on the ITT board and is set to be a turnaround specialist with a growth track record. And how about Estelle Braklenov? Let's restart the 45 seconds countdown. You guys ready? The future CEO of Veolia was born in 1972. She graduated from one of the most prestigious school combinations there is in France with Polytechnique and L'Ecole des Ponts. If you get asked, you can shorten it that way. She's an ex. She then worked in infrastructure, as I already alluded to, before joining Veolia in 2005. Her 17 years and counting journey there would take her through rising roles in Paris before getting appointed CEO of Veolia UK and Ireland. Antoine Frérot called her back to Paris in 2018 to become the group's number two as COO, a role she still holds for a couple of months before climbing the last step on the ladder next July. She's said to have proven her worth and gained her promotion during her outstanding management of the Suez Veolia merger discussions. And on a side, she's sitting on the board of Hermes. The strength of the origins. <laughs> Now that we better know both of them, what are these challenges they have to overcome? Let's start with Estelle Brakenov. She'll be heading a 230,000 heads giant with a 37 billion euros annual turnover. But she'll also have to integrate the teams and managers jumping over from Suez. Plus, she needs to do all of that fast enough to keep Veolia's ability to further transform into a circular economy company. And if her relationship with Antoine Frérot is said to be excellent, she will nevertheless have to manage his legacy and shadow as he he'll keep leading Veolia's board, a situation Sabrina Soussan knows very well, as it is more or less what she experienced leading Dormakaba under the close watch of its former CEO. Whatever's going on here, stop it immediately. But her challenges as head of Suez might well be of a fully different magnitude. First, there's a kingdom to rebuild on the remains of an empire. If the new Suez keeps its French assets almost untouched, 40% of these contracts are set to be renewed in the next years. Abroad, the challenge is even wider, with only 2 billion euros of turnover remaining remaining in quite scattered geographies from Australia to India through Africa. Will Suez's new shareholders help the group to invest in its regrowth? That's going to be a central question. Then, Sabrina Soussan will have to leverage the competencies of Anna Giros and Maximilian Pellegrini. You know, those competencies could have earned them her job. So... I understand nothing. But if she manages to navigate all of that, the new Suez, pruned down to 45,000 employees and 7 billion euros turnover, could be much more agile than Veolia and regain parts of what it just lost. Now, before sharing my bets on the future of both companies, 
I'd like to take on the elephant in the room. Estelle Brakenhoff and Sabrina Soussan are two women. When she takes over Antoine Frérot's position, Estelle Brakenhoff will only be the second woman among all the CEO of Francis CAC 40 companies. Two out of 40. That's five percent. Yeah, I'm a man, so I'm good at maths. How dare you? Suez won't be public anymore, but the symbolism is equally strong here, especially if we figure Sabrina Soussan as somehow following in the path of Isabelle Cochet, the former CEO of Engie, the company that sold its stakes in Suez to Veolia. I have to say that's the kind of occasion where I'm proud of our water industry. It's not much, but it's something. But will it last? The one with the hardest task from our two new protagonists may well be Estelle Brakenhoff. Indeed, she has to welcome 45,000 new employees in one delivery and demonstrate synergies to justify the entire move. Even if these synergies exist, there is an execution challenge to make them come to life. The analogy that comes to mind is the building of the Death Star in Star Wars. And I'm not even remotely comparing Estelle Brakenhoff to Darth Vader. Once built, the Death Star may well be the strongest weapon there is, but as long as it's still in the building phase, more agile players can hover around and end up destroying it. We live in a fast transforming world and groups the size of Veolia have to keep changing to adapt. And Estelle Brakenhoff's ability to replicate what she's done in the UK on a broader scale will be closely observed. On Sabrina Soussan's end, the challenge is very different. She will have to be defensive in France and fight to keep her water and waste contracts. Keep in mind that 2022 is an election year in France and that within the long cycle of private public shifts, we are rather in a period where public water management is the trend. But if Meridiam and GIP insist so much on having Sabrina Soussan, it's probably because of her international and outsider profile. So it would be surprising not to see Suez be quite offensive, especially in Asia and Africa. There are synergies to leverage with Meridian's direct investments in Africa and a critical scale to rebuild to double on the midterm the current 2 billion euros international turnover that's left in the new Suez. The questions are, do Suez's new shareholders have this endeavor of regrowth? And if yes, how much are they ready to dive into their pockets to sustain this ambition? I'm reasonably optimistic for both of them but I also have many questions open so please pardon me if I'm direct but dear Estelle dear Sabrina I'd be thrilled to raise you these questions directly on my podcast microphone I'm available whenever you are Watch this video if you'd like to get more insights into the merger challenges I just mentioned talking of Estelle Brakenhoff's roadmap, you'll get a glimpse into the scary closet of Suez and Veolia's difficulties with mergers and acquisitions. And if you're still here, you probably enjoyed my content, so make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the next releases. I'll see you next time.